Thank you, everyone. Yes, Acrolinx will be 17 years old, actually, on Saturday. So um, uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be celebrating. Um, yeah, it's been a long journey. Um, and uh, every year has felt a bit different. Uh, think lots of things are changing. Um, th things continue to change at a very fast pace around um, content and technology for content. Um, and that's a little bit of what I'm going to talk about today is, is uh, in, in this slot is not so much about Acrolinx but about the context, um, the way that we see uh, automation and AI helping um, support some of the interesting changes that are happening in the way content gets written. Um, I'd be interested also in hearing a little bit from, from you how you see these things. Um, First of all, yeah, I apologize that this isn't in Swedish. My, uh, you wouldn't want to hear my attempt at Swedish. I did actually study at Swedish. I told Magnus yesterday, I, um, when during my first degree, we uh, studying translation, uh, because German was one of my languages, I learned uh, Swedish uh, along with Danish as kind of one language. Uh, um, with some little differences in spelling, but we kind of pretended it was the same language for a while, which was quite fun. Uh, just to understand, enough to be able to read it, but um, you wouldn't want to hear me try to speak it. So, um, thank you for listening to my English. Um, happy to talk to you in German or French if you're more comfortable with that. But, um, yeah, I wanted to talk today a little bit about the things that we see happening in the industry around content. Um, how many of you feel that your job has changed significantly in the last 12 months? One person? <laughs> ben? 24 months? A little bit? We see some very dramatic changes, and this is not so much to do with automation, but to do with the things that are driving the need for automation. Um, how many people are, are using AI in their daily lives? Or know that they're using AI in their daily lives? Not so much. Um, Siri, those kinds of things. Is it starting to feel like it's a, a thing that you're getting used to living with? I think in the world of, um, you know, the, the world of business content where we, where we uh, are busy, um, we see a lot of significant changes. Uh, and I, I think it's easy to think of AI as the thing that is causing those changes, but actually I think it's the other way around. I think AI is, is in a way, the, um, it's part of the solution to challenges that are arising anyway. So it's kind of in that context that I'll, that I'll try and put the whole thing. Those of you who I guess everyone knows Acrolinx and who Acrolinx is, but when we talk about AI, for a long time we kept quiet about us being an AI company. We just focused on the problem that we solve, and suddenly we realized that all these other companies were talking about how they were AI companies. And because uh, it's interesting, we, we, when we say we sell AI to AI companies, if you look at the, the technology companies we sell to uh, or work with, um, we... Um, uh, we um, work very closely with companies that have very strong AI technologies. Um, and it's interesting that nevertheless they, they come to us. They come to us to help with content creation. Um, and the reason that, that I think this is important is, again, there's been a realization that there's a whole lot of effort gone around the delivery of content. And this is not so much relevant just for marketing content, but for all of the content that you put in front of a customer. There's been over the last 10, 15 years, huge focus on how do we deliver the content that we have? How do we, initially it was, how can we do single source publishing so that we can then uh, optimize the way that we translate it and deal with multiple versions. Um, people were then, so they, there was a move towards structured content and keeping all your content in one place. Um, then people started to talk about personalization, how can you understand maybe giving different content to different people depending on who they are. Um, all of this assumed that there was content there, that it kind of 
fell from heaven or it, it just appeared. And then we could deliver it and work out how it happened. The whole content creation piece has been kind of the last piece that people have, um, have typically uh, started to try to develop a strategy around. Um, so though people are spending about half the money that they're spending on content in general, they're spending on the creation of content, it's the least planned, the least structured part of the process. So that's on the one side. On the other side, we see that content has to do more and more work. Content, companies need content in order to be able to be competitive. We were at, at, um, at a company yesterday who said that they, for them, this was, it was absolutely clear that content was the way in which they were going to be successful. There's, there's um, uh, increasingly in every market, there's a lot of innovation, there's more global competition than ever, than, than ever before. And in that environment, you have to be, you have to move faster and you have to build these relationships and, and because these relationships are bigger than ever and more distributed than ever, content is the only way of you being successful. And so it's not a matter of when we started with Acrolinks, um, uh, we have to write this documentation because it's the law. <laughs> it's moved towards we have to write this documentation because, uh, or this product content in general because um, that's the way people will um, be successful with our product. Content is great at delivering personalized experience, but that always assumes that the right content is available. When you talk about, increasingly people are talking about, we have different audiences to, that we write for, um, uh, that kind of assumes that if you're delivering different content for different audiences, that you have the ability to create that content for those different audiences. How many people are writing different content for different people deliberately? Okay, so a good amount of people. As this increasingly comes, this idea, why do you care about writing different content for different people? Because you're trying to create that relationship through the content. Um, but it means then, more you have to write more content. Somebody needs to write this stuff. And the volumes of it, I think quite often, our, um, we all have our heads down doing our, um, doing, doing our bit. Quite often it's, it's easy to, get, um, to lose the big picture of how much content actually gets put in front of customers. And much of this content, we talk about content because in a very generic way, um, just to be clear that when we talk about content, we're talking about written words. Quite often when you talk to people about content, they think about the... Um, the shiny, uh, the shiny bits of content at the very top, and I like to think of those as the as the as the tip of the iceberg. Um, feels like an appropriate analogy for for um, for here, not quite, but nearly. Um, they, there's a lot of there's a lot of very visible content. That very visible content typically gets very um, very carefully uh, gets a lot of discussion. It gets a, a lot of um, a, a lot of people investing time and effort on that content. Um, this may be the, the, the first page of the website or the, the, the image video, the, the one thing that is, you know, is the, the advert that you're putting out um, for the new product. Whatever it is, that's the thing that gives you a lot of visibility. But in fact, although that's what everybody sees, in fact, when it comes to the the actual work getting done, um, that all, that's this huge body of, of the floating iceberg under the water. Um, and the volume of it is, is astonishing. We're starting to get data now on, on what uh, a larger range of customers are doing. Um, just one example. The, German, the entire German Wikipedia is about 1.5 billion words we call gigawords just because it's um, that's the kind of volume that we're getting used to. Um, we collect um, as part of our tracking of load on looking at what uh, um, what's going on, on, on uh, in the cloud, the Acrolinks cloud, um, we obviously see the volumes of content that are going 
um, that, that, that people are, are checking. Um, the week before last, this is a week, uh, a week old, um, we, we checked more than the German Wikipedia in a single week. So, um, and this is not even all of Acrolinks by any means. Um, this is, this is a, uh, was on one of the cloud instances that we have. So the volumes of content that people are creating is, is staggering. Not just the volumes, the size of it, but also the speed of it. Everything needs to go faster nowadays. And um, there are good reasons for that. It's to do with the fact that, you know, again, like with relationships, people have realized that speed is a competitive advantage. So um, we're, we're um, increasingly coming across this idea of continuous delivery in release of, of technology. Even if you're building trucks and buses and um, uh, other huge machines, they're typically driven by software and increasingly is the expectation that those things will, will somehow get updates on their own <laughs> uh, over the air. Um, they will become better products as at, at, at every day when you come and use them. And so there's this idea of continuous delivery came out of the software world where, of course, it's a virtual product, but increasingly that's gone into the, the analog world of where people are expecting their products to behave that way. I expect my phone to be better every day. Um, but uh, increasingly, uh, you expect your car to suddenly be able to park itself or do other stuff that it couldn't do uh, because it gets updates over the air. This process is another significant disruption in the way content gets created. Um, famous example, Amazon. Does anyone know how often Amazon releases their product? Their platform for selling stuff? Any guesses? Weekly? Weekly? They release product every second. And um, they actually release multiple products every second. So they will do, like in the standard kind of uh, a world of, of web content delivery, instead of just doing A-B testing on their web content, they do A-B testing on their product. So they will release two different versions of a product and see which one works better. And then prune off the ones that aren't so interesting and move towards the ones that are working well. In this scale, in this speed, Content still needs to be there. It still needs to work. It still needs to, you still need to interact with it. You still need to, as a, as a person using that, you still need to uh, be able to interact with it, have a relationship with it. And of course, in, that, in this world where everything's moving twice as fast and there's billions of words of content, the old ways of creating content are typically broken. They, we've seen lots of companies now deliberately breaking things that they've been doing for 20 years or had been doing for 20 years because the old ways of creating content could not keep up with this world of billions of words of content moving at 100 miles an hour. Um, this is often what content looks like. And there's one significant change here that, that we've started to see, we've increasingly seen, um, which is that there are very few actual writers in this picture. And increasingly, we see um, that because of the need for speed and the need for, um, for the content to move with the product as quickly as the product moves, increasingly subject matter experts are the people who have to do the writing. I know we have a presentation from Saab coming up today about exactly this topic, that in this world where you have to move fast, in the world where you want a genuine voice of the company, a genuine voice of the product to talk about the technology in a way that shows expertise and passion and excitement, typically the subject matter experts are the people who are being asked to create the content. So there's some sort of strategy, there's some sort of need identified for some piece of content. And then typically the subject matter experts are the ones that are being asked to create this content. They're not writers, they know stuff. 
but they're not writers. They wouldn't regard themselves as writers. And then what happens is, this typically comes in then to some sort of team, uh, occasionally this is called a center of excellence of some kind, or an editing team, who, who need to try to um, get that content ready for the target audiences that maybe you've lined up, but also in terms of the style guide and the branding and all those other things that, that, the, um, that the company has decided they, uh, they want their content to, uh, to align with. Um, occasionally then you'll pull in outside resources because you can't possibly get the, the volume of content that's coming at the speed of the coming. You'll call people in to help. They can come in and help, but they're expensive. Um, so you'll then somehow get the content through that process and then you have stakeholders and the stakeholders have to then, um, everybody has an opinion, right? You're trying to go at 100 miles an hour, but you need sign off from eight people in order to get the document, piece of content, the blog article, the story, whatever, out of the door. And what we see here increasingly is that although everyone has an opinion, it's very hard for them to agree. Although they've all agreed, they've all signed up to whatever it is you're all trying to do, in the best case, you've got all this written down, still everyone has an opinion. And every one of those opinions can point you back to the start where you have to go back to the subject matter experts and say, can you, we need to, whatever. And it has to go through legal. Legal can torpedo the whole process and say, no, we can't say that. We have to say something else. And it has to go back to the subject matter experts and say, can we say that? Is that really true? Technically, is that true? And you start again. So this process, although you think of it going left to right, is that right? Uh, you think about it going left to right. And in fact, um, it will go through several cycles. And um, meanwhile, the content team is sitting there going, we need to get this out. We need to release it. We have a, you know, the, the competition's already released theirs, and we're now, you know, behind. And so there's this, this pressure for speed, and this, all of these people trying to work together to get stuff done. So, speed, volume, this complexity of this landscape, as I say, it's not the robots that are kind of invading the world, it's the, 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 the robots to some extent are here to, to save the world. Um, I get asked about once a week um, by people who are just getting to know what we do. So do you write content? Uh, we don't. There are companies starting to do this. Um, some very interesting ones in, in, in certain areas. Um, uh, so, Narrative Science is a well-known Canadian company. There's a company called Posado that does subject line um, optimization, generation of, of, of interesting subject lines that will get you to, to, to open the emails more effectively. Um, there's an interesting company in, in, in Berlin called Retresco that does um, a lot of work in e-commerce, so creating, automatically generating um, uh, text around, based on, on product features. So some good stuff happening. Um, this is quite a long way from where we are. Um, the type of content that we typically help people with, um, it, it would be very hard to know what to tell a robot to write. <laughs> um, right now, um, the in terms of um, the full range of content that we, that we typically support, marketing content needs to be engaging and, and fresh and f um, uh, exciting. Um, technical product content needs to be accurate. It's built on a whole range of, 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 um, of technical knowledge, but it's also driven towards a goal of getting something done, usually helping somebody do something or understand some, some range of features. Um, Right now, uh, the generation of text is not, is not something that the technology can, can realistically offer. This is coming, but it's, um, at the moment, the robots don't know what to say, I think. One interesting area, uh, just to, to think through this, the, the, way this, um, the way this works, you've all, you've all seen uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme doing the splits going backwards on a truck. When I bring this up, I always like to ask people, do they know which brand it was that, that was doing this? A lot of people don't know that the trucks were going backwards. 
um, typically about half the people in the audience haven't noticed that the trucks are going backwards, which is actually the selling point. It's the whole point of the advert is that they're going backwards and that it's cool reversing stuff that the trucks can do um, is the whole point. Um, you will definitely notice that if you're in the market for buying trucks, but if you're a part, member of the general public, you probably won't. Anyway, we all know this is um, the Volvo story. Um, but what was interesting about this is that um, this was a fantastic piece of awareness. It's the tip of the iceberg where you get that you get everybody has seen this. This um, uh, certainly everybody who uh, is involved in in communicating. Uh, products to uh, to a business audience. Everybody knows this story, but in fact, the story doesn't really do anything. Um, what where this gets interesting is the is the the the, the, the bit of the iceberg that's under the water. Um, what Volvo did really well here was to build um, a story where they would take the people they were actually targeting with this video and start to engage them. With, um, with more detailed videos initially, and then moving on to all of the content that came after that. And it's this journey, this creation of a, of a customer experience, as, you, uh, 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 as it's called, where you join up all those different pieces of content that really makes a difference to the business. And Volvo did a fantastic job of not just um, you know, the, the awareness, the videos that followed from that, but the but tying it into a whole um, a whole journey, um, and it was hugely successful. The um, so the question remains: How do all these words get written in this environment where you have all of this stuff going on? Um, how does it get done? And it's it's our assertion that um, you know the reason why we're here is that we believe that you can't do this without some platform to support it, some technology to support it. Um, so companies have all these aspirations that they've written down. They have all their style guides, increasingly tone of voice is coming in, even in technical product content. Um, how many people have tone of voice, something that they need to talk about in their style guides and things now? A few? Yeah, most of you? Interesting. Ten years ago, nobody doing technical product content had any guidance on what tone of voice to use. Nowadays, everyone is trying to move their tone of voice to be a bit more conversational, a bit more uh, human, as they sometimes laughingly say. I think it's a funny aspiration. Uh, of course, communication is about uh, being human. Um, but um, it's interesting, and the, the reason this is happening, I think, is because increasingly, Marketing teams are realizing it's no good just having that tone of voice on our marketing material, the tip of the iceberg. It has to go right the way through the iceberg. So companies have all these aspirations about um, their, their typical style guides around writing well for translation and for a global audience and all those other good things that we've been doing for years. But increasingly, branding and tone of voice are coming in. And of course, the whole terminology, um, uh, words and phrases, SEO, I know we're going to hear more about that today as well. Um, all of these things are kind of written down, but um, it's very hard to operationalize them. And um, you can think of, you know, if you like, our mission in, 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 in this whole story is to, is to help take those, those guidelines, those goals that you have, and, um, and, and operationalize them. So what the AI can do, AI can be quite stupid, as we know. Uh, you've probably seen all these pictures of uh, being able to fool image recognition machines um, uh, and the stuff they come up with as um, uh, elephants in this case. Um, AI can also be quite unpleasant. There are risks behind it. A few years ago, a couple of years ago, there was a sudden realization that learning from the internet wasn't always a great idea. Um, any of you have... Uh, this, is, this is quite an old picture, about a year old. But if you type why are some group of people so, and then look at what Google completes with it, um, you used to get some extremely offensive um, uh, suggestions. They don't do this anymore. So Google has taken the effort by hand, not by learning it, but by manually overriding these suggestions, 
So um, none of these suggestions will come up anymore. But they've done that by hand. Um, and so there's been this growing up of the process around AI. You can't just learn everything. You have to uh, intervene. And especially as a brand, you have to intervene. There's this famous story of uh, Tay, the, um, the, um, the chat bot that, learnt, <coughs> learnt from, that Microsoft built that learned from the internet. Um, and that didn't go very well. Um, so for, the, for the, the companies we typically work with, um, like yourselves, brand is much more about just learning. It's also about giving you the power to run this platform that will help you as an organization um, uh, create content at this scale and at this speed that, that I think we all need to do. So that's kind of, if you like, our, our mission. Um, the robots are now, in our view, a much more collaborative part of the process. They're, a, they're an agent or a service inside this um, uh, increasingly automated, increasingly fast-moving, high-scale place where you do it, uh, where you create content. Um, and the role of them really is to do stuff like this. So this is Tesla's autopilot. Um, and what's nice, of course, is that it shows that certain things, certain aspects of driving, um, you can give to the machines. They're better at it than we are. They don't read their email or update their Facebook pages while they're driving. Um, they just have one job to do. And the technology... Um, uh, that we provide um, is not going to replace the process of driving, but it's going to take over a lot of the uh, the work that, um, frankly, the machines can do better than people. So, in order to do that, we have this new concept that I'll talk more about this afternoon um, of um, the content creation platform, the Acrolinks platform becoming uh, our AI engines, but actually a whole bunch of other AI engines as well, to help support this, um, this massively complex process. In the old days, there would be one CMS that everything was in. At least for one team, there would be one CMS. Um, there would be one tool that people were using to create content, and there'd be one place where that content would go. Uh, I don't think it ever, that was ever true, but at least that was the aspiration. I think increasingly companies are realizing that that's just not realistic. If you want to have a customer experience that goes across this whole journey like I just showed with Volvo, and you need to accept that different teams are going to use different tool sets, they're going to use diff the content's going to be in different places. Um, and so increasingly, um, it doesn't really matter where the content is, it doesn't matter which tools you use to create it with, and it doesn't really matter where this content is going we want to be sure that it's doing the right job, that it's going to be effective. Um, and um, I'll talk more about that this afternoon, but that's kind of the spirit of where this is going, I think, in order to be able to meet this need um, that, that we see people delivering with. So um, we talk about this idea of capturing, uh, capturing all these goals that I've talked about um, and using AI engines, some of which developed by us, some developed by partners, um, uh, to be able to analyze content against those goals. Um, the, the notion of automatically scoring content. Um, when we started, we were often called uh, a, an, an authoring support tool in some way. Increasingly, um, that's remained a very important part of what we do. That's number three. But increasingly, as we're moving faster through a process, we have to support the process as well. And so scoring content without necessarily uh, there being a human in the process, scoring the content is, inc is incredibly important. And uh, to the point at the bottom, where you have that, that bunch of people who have to edit and read all the content, um, typically they can only read or edit 1% of the content that, they, that the customer uh, is going to see. Um, we can help you get that to 100%. So that's kind of the, the idea behind this, uh, this, this scoring part. The third part is the real-time guidance that you all know so well. This idea of a friendly kind of editor in a box that can support you and, and especially support non-writers who, um, uh, who would benefit from a little friendly editor sitting over their shoulder looking at their content. Um, 
And finally, as I talked a, a lot about last year, um, uh, we've, we've invested an awful lot in, in, in analytics and the ability to know where you're going with your content and where you have issues with your content, where to focus your resources. Um, because when everything's moving at 100 miles an hour, you can't, um, you can't always know where to focus your efforts. So, um, why do we do this? I think increasingly, as I said at the beginning, people realize they need content. Organizations realize they need content. It's not something they do because they have to do it. It's something they do because if they do it well, it's a competitive advantage. And so people are starting to measure um, engagement. Uh, who's reading the content? How often do people read it? And which pieces of content do they read and do they like? Do they rate it? Increasingly, customers are collecting ratings for their content. Was this useful? Was this? Did you like this? Um, it, right across the uh, the customer journey, and in those environments, you can start to measure the effect of a piece of content on customer satisfaction or net promoter scores or, or whatever. And then bigger goals that people are are, uh, are are getting aligned with around this kind of customer experience, customer journey thing. Ultimately, with the idea of keeping more customers. Um, Many companies have realized that winning customers is one thing, but actually keeping them is even more valuable than winning them, right? This again is something that kind of started in the software business, but then suddenly everyone realized that it was true for every product, right? So um, that whole notion is something we'll be talking more about this afternoon. Or I'll be talking about it in the, in the product roadmap because it's something that's inspired our, our approach to where the product is going. Um, uh, a lot of people have started calling this active content governance. Um, getting some, uh, you know, as I say, as you're moving so fast and you've got all of these things going on, increasingly there's, the, there's, this, uh, di there's this desire to get your arms around your content. I see a lot of people doing this when they talk about what they need, is I want to get, I'd like to just get, know what I have and know what's going on. And, um, and that's what this governance gives you. And, and why do we call it active? Um, because it's this idea that it's not just about seeing what's happening, it's about actually helping. It's about being in there and being part of that process, working um, efficiently. Um, so, that was me. One last slide, if I may. Um, in addition to our wonderful uh, Swedish event that we do, um, uh, that Fadina does every year, where very happy to come to. I'd like to invite you also to our um, European event. We have one. I'd like to invite you to the Boston one. We have one in in, in Boston uh, in June. We also have one in Berlin. Um, will be a very exciting event with lots of great speakers. Um, uh, you can um, register now. Uh, there'll be uh, workshops that are really popular. Um, and uh, yeah, the opportunity to not just share with, uh, with um, your colleagues here or nearby, but uh, across the whole of Europe. And in fact, there'll be uh, quite a few US companies there as well. So to help understand what other people are doing and what's going on in the content world in general at, at similar companies to yours, um, you would be most welcome. Thank you. <laughs>